morning and welcome to Northside Online. Thanks so much for being with us today. We're going to get the service started in just a moment, but first we wanted to make sure that all of you who are attending online today know that even though you aren't here in the building, we still consider you part of the service. So we want to make sure you're aware of the many ways that you can keep connected remotely. First, we want to encourage you to take a moment to fill out our digital connection card by following the connect link on your screen. With the connection card, you can share ministry needs, prayer requests, or ask for more information about Northside. Second, head over to our Facebook page by tapping the link and hit the like button. That's another great way to keep up to date with everything that's going on at Northside. And finally, you'll want to have our church app downloaded, and you can get that by following the app link on your screen or by texting NCCBerg app to 77977. The app is the best all around way to learn more about Northside, find media, and sign up for events. It's time to get things going. Thanks again for tuning in to Northside Online. Hey, good morning. Welcome to Northside. Thanks for being here with us. Let's go ahead and stand up if you can lift our voices to our God. He deserves our praise. Sing to him, the lion and the lamb.
Good morning. Welcome to Northside Christian Church. We are so happy to have you here with us today. Today is Palm Sunday, and this is the day we celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And when he came in riding on the donkey, they laid down their cloaks, and they laid down palm branches, and they cheered hallelujah and shouted hosanna. And then a few days later, they killed him, and they laid him in a tomb. But here's the good news. My Jesus did not stay in that tomb. My Jesus conquered the grave. He ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And for that reason, I get to live forever. And in one week, we are going to celebrate that on Easter Sunday. We'll start on Saturday. We're going to have an Easter egg hunt. There will be activities. There will be free food. There will be a bouncy house. All kinds of fun stuff for everybody to do. And then we'll have a service on Saturday night. And then Sunday, we'll have our three services that we usually have. 8 o'clock will be a bluegrass service. We will have kids uh, programming all, th all four services. Right? All four services? Yes, all four services. Okay, had to double check that. If you need some more information about it, you can check the QR codes on the back of the seats. You can check the, the app on your phone or go to the website. Again, we're happy to have you here with us today. Let's continue to worship. I tried so hard to see it. It took me so long to Choose someone like me to carry your victory. Perfection could never burn it. You give what we don't deserve, and you take the broken things, raise them to glory.
shadow where I hide the ransom for my life always my soul is you are mine you're mine oh you are mine you're mine oh you are
Victory. 
done, for what he continues to do. Amen. You can have a seat. Good morning. My name is Mark Beck. I'm a facilities manager at Northside. After I pray, we'll have communion, and you'll notice the tables in the four corners of the room. The platter's on top, uh, it holds cups. The bottom cup has the bread, the top cup has the juice. We're heading into Easter week. Due to the differences between the Jewish and the Western calendars in Israel, today is Passover. Three Jewish holidays happen this week. Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. More on this later after my story. I once in anger pushed a man against the wall. I immediately knew I was wrong. I felt horrible. I attacked and sinned, this man, sinned against this man. I later found the man and apologized. I looked him in the eye, apologized, and I asked for his forgiveness. I think he could see in my face that I was upset with my actions. His face changed and he forgave me. I could see the forgiveness in his eyes. I could feel the lump in my throat and my burden leave. The memory of my actions is not gone and may it never begin, be gone. But the burden, the burden is gone. The festival of Passover. At Passover, the Jews were directed to slay a lamb and take the blood and wipe it on the doorpost and the lintel. That way the spirit of God would pass over and not take their firstborn. Now picture Jesus on the cross, blood from the beating on the heads and the nails in his hands, the lintel and the doorpost. The festival of unleavened bread, the festival of unleavened bread follows on the next day. The Jews are instructed to leave no leaven in their bread. In fact, they accomplish a thorough search of their home and get to get rid of all leaven. Now picture a loaf of flat bread without leaven and Jesus in the tomb. Jesus absent from the world and his spirit absent for three days. On the third day, the festival of first fruits occurs. The first crop of the season to become ripe is barley. The Jews are direct, biblically directed to offer the first fruits of their harvest to God in recognition and thanks. Now picture the people bringing sheaves of grain, some to be burnt, some to be given to the priests, and the remainder to the poor. Now picture the tomb open, Christ coming out alive, raised from the dead, the presence of Jesus returning to the world. Jesus is the first fruits of God's promised resurrection to all of us. The man who I sinned against forgave me. Christ has also forgiven me. So I have a question for each of you. Who do you need to seek forgiveness from? Who do you need to forgive even though they have not apologized? Let's pray. Father, we come to you broken and ashamed, but we also know that we can ask for your forgiveness, thanking you for grace and knowing that we too will be raised to be part of your kingdom. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.
If you haven't already done so, we'd encourage you to sign the connection cards. That gives us an opportunity to find out about your presence and then any prayer requests you might have, any needs that you might have that the church can help you with. You know, as we come to our time of offering, we hear all the time churches talk about, we need your money, we need your money. And yes, that's what keeps the doors open, that's what keeps the lights on, that's what pays our staff. So yes, that's very, very important. But we wanted to share with you some of the things that your contributions, your support and generosity have done for Northside Christian Church and for the Big C Church around the world. Last year, in the midst of a pandemic and a global shutdown, we had 50 new members here at Northside. We baptized 31 individuals last year. Second service today, we baptized seven-year-old Kyra Potts. And that was really exciting to be a part of that. So yeah, give yourselves a hand for that. And when you stop and think about it, we were a virtual church from March to June, and we were less than full capacity for much of the year, and still added 50 new members, baptized 31 new souls. So that was great. A few weeks ago, David Fancher, who is the president of Central Christian College of the Bible, was here, and he said that Northside has been their largest contributor. Last year, we were the number one supporter of the, the college, more so than the second and third leading contributors combined. And that's just one of the areas that we serve. They're going to be able to expand their college into Ohio and touch more lives and, lead, and teach more leaders in that way. We also support the Bacons and the Hawkins doing the sojourn for Boston. We have Adrian and Lula Sanchez down in Texcoco, Mexico. We have the uh, Christ, Central Christian, excuse me, the Christian Campus House here in Warrensburg because of your support, because of your generosity. We're able to serve all of these ministries and so many more. And we thank you for all of that. And we encourage you to continue with your giving in that way. If you have not already had a chance to do so, go ahead and open up your phone app. That's how you can make your, your tithes and offerings today. You can do so by going to the website or we have the boxes at the back of the worship center. Every month, we also challenge the congregation with the hashtag for the bird campaign to show how generous Northside Christian Church is and how much we love our community and how much Jesus loves them. A few more days left in the campaign for March where we are paying it backward. It's where you pay for the car behind you at the gas station. You pay for the food for the people behind you at the drive-in window. You pick up the tab for somebody at a restaurant or at the grocery store. Whatever way that you can pay it backward and help the community know that we are for them and Jesus loves them. So let's keep up with that, all right? Okay, so now it is time to pull out your app, follow the sermon notes as Sid brings the message. You uh, know Kyra Potts, welcome her uh, <clears throat> to the church family. It was so funny, uh, several people told me all week at school, she was telling people, I'm going to be baptized, I'm going to be baptized on Sunday. She's so excited, so enthusiastic about it. Uh, I hope and I hope all of us can be that enthusiastic about our faith. I, I, I want to amplify what Joe said. You know, I brag on you guys. Y- y'all have grown in generosity where... You're making a big difference with the, the money that you give, with the investment in your time and your talents. Uh, we're stretching out and making a difference in this community. I thank you for your part in that. It all, it's all about growing from uh, fear to generosity. And that's what uh, I, I just want to say you're making progress. I'm proud and love being a part of this church family. And thank you for that. So if you were in a, able to jump in a time machine and you went back to let's say 1982 and you happen to run across the Chicago Bears NFL football team now I was very impressionable there 82 I was 19 years old I, I was a football player so I, I, I kept up with the Bears and you notice this team and they're all these huge guys 6'5 300 pounds and then you see this little guy about 5'10 maybe a little less than 200 pounds you're like what are you like the manager or whatever no he wore number 34 in my opinion the best running back that ever played his nickname was sweetness how about that for a football player Walter Payton was his name and Walter Payton thankfully they were able to win a Super Bowl in 1985 so he experienced that 
Tragically, he developed a liver disease and died at the age of 45. But boy, he packed a lot into those years. His appearance was deceiving. What you saw would have confused you. You might have thought maybe he's supernaturally gifted or he's supernaturally fast. Mike Dicka, the Chicago Bears football coach, he said of Walter Payton, he's the best football player I have ever seen. But even more, he's the best person I've ever known. See, Walter Payton uh, didn't always dream of being a football player. He was a, a scout. He was in the band. He, he didn't even start playing football until he was 11th grade. He went, no uh, Division I schools offered him a scholarship. And he, he developed, and even more, he developed a way that can, all of us can learn from. Another young running back went to Walter and said, I want to train with you. I, I want to see your secrets. I want, to, I want to try to be as good as you one day. And he said, Walter did it. Meet me at 8 o'clock at the gym. And so the young running back did. 15 minutes into the workout, he was falling over and done. And Walter Payton kept going. In Chicago, where he lived, Arlington Heights, they have a hill that's named Walter Payton Hill because he used to run up and down it every day. And Chicago has winter every day. He ran up down this hill. Walter Payton today is remembered every year each of the 32 NFL teams nominates a player who is given back to their community who has invested, not for their, their talents on the field, but they've given back. They've done a lot of community beneficial projects. Every team has a nominee, and one of those nominees out of the 32 selected is the Walter Payton Man of the Year. Well, a lot more to Walter Payton than you could see in the appearance. A lot more to Jesus Christ than maybe you would know and frankly I think sometimes people come to Jesus not knowing what that really means we've been studying uh, the last week today and next week the Messiah in preparation for resurrection day we're we're figuring out who Jesus was as the the chosen one the anointed one that's what Messiah means and we're seeing today that a lot of folks didn't really understand they didn't understand the Jesus who was underneath the surface. And so that's what we're going to look at today. I want to give you four levels of response to Jesus that this passage gives us. John chapter 12, verses 20 through 43. The first level is reaching. Notice what happens. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. The festival is Passover. This is the beginning of the last week of Jesus' life on earth they came to Philip who was from Bethsaida in Galilee with a request sir they said we would like to see Jesus that's how it begins you know, they were Gentiles Greeks uh, they were used to the Greek system of many gods but these gods were more a, a story they were there was not any kind of interpersonal interaction there was there was not any kind of discipleship or following them that wasn't how this worked. <clears throat> Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. We would like to see Jesus. The French philosopher Pascal said, there is a God-sized hole in every person. We were meant to be spiritual. That's why in any culture, you see some kind of deity system. We were meant to have that hole filled by coming back to God, by committing ourselves to him, by walking in fellowship with him. But what we do is tend to try to fill that hole with all kinds of other stuff. We try to fill it with experiences. We try to fill it with substances. We try to fill it with career achievements. Or material goods these guys got it that 
they heard about Jesus and they wanted to see him. If you're on the fence, if you're not sure who Jesus is, I commend you for being here today. Keep searching. Keep looking. You're watching us line. Keep looking because that God-sized hole has to be filled with something. And I believe with all my heart, it's Jesus. I spent some years away from Jesus. I tried to fill that hole with other things. But I started to search. I started to look. I didn't want to be a Christian just because I grew up in America. So I read about the different religions. And then I read a book by C.S. Lewis called Mere Christianity. It showed me for the first time you can be a Christian and have a brain. But it began with the search. You, if you're in that stage, you have to begin with a search. And even more, I want you to realize that there are people around you. Just like Philip here, it tells Andrew and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus, there are people around you that will be searching. And just like these disciples, you can point them to Jesus with your words. Even more, you can help them when they sense, when they understand that they have this God-sized hole, you can help them to, toward Jesus. Reaching is that first stage. Realization is the second. This is realizing who Jesus really is. Jesus knew his crowd. He knew that not all of them got it. They were impressed by the miracles. They were impressed by the popularity. When Jesus goes into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, everybody is giving him praise. He's an object of much love and adoration. But then, by Friday, he's on the cross. They didn't really get it. Jesus wants us to see the cost. To see the cost of following him. To see the cost he himself is paying. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies... It remains only a single seed. In other words, get this. The seed, the plant, is not meant to just serve itself. The plant is not meant to be the object of attention. The plant, if it dies, produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. This week, maybe even right now, I want you to meditate on this phrase, this sentence. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. Does that mean that you're supposed to hate yourself? Does that mean that you're supposed to look down on yourself to be disgusted with yourself? No, no, that's not what he's saying. But what he is saying, anyone who is self-centered, anyone who who thinks it's all about them, they will lose it. Life eventually will end. If all your priority and all your passion has been poured into you and making yourself look good, you're going to be disappointed. While anyone who hates their life, that is, sees God as more important, sees others as more important, anyone who hates their life in this world We'll keep it for eternal life. So, from that agricultural analogy, what he's saying is, if you want to come follow me, if you want to see me, you need to understand that the Christian life is about sacrifice. And he led the way. The Christian life is about service. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now, the paradox is this. If you live a life of sacrifice and service for Jesus, you get blessed. I've been a minister a long time, and I'm like, man, that made me feel better. I hope it did something for them. That's the beauty of following him, but it does not seem that way from the outside in. It doesn't seem that way just looking on the surface. Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. That is, Jesus left 
his fellowship with God in heaven and became human so that he could become the sacrificial lamb. He became human to show us that the best way to live is to sacrifice and serve others. You have to see that cost. You need to count that cost. When folks here want to become a Christian like Kyra did earlier, I sit down with them with a starting point to talk to them and communicate to them, this is a commitment. This is a discipleship that you're entering. You need to understand those costs and be willing to, to live that life. I'm glad to do that with you. If you want to become a Christian or you want to join our church, we can sit down and visit. But we need to understand the cost. We need to see it going in. We also need to see the boss. And Jesus, again, modeled this for us. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. I would love to have been there. If there like I say, I was talking about a time machine. I'd like to go back and see the bears, Walter Payton in the flesh. I'd love to be there and look at the people's faces when this voice just comes down out of heaven. But notice what brought the voice. Jesus says, Father, glorify your name. Now, Jesus was both man and God and yet he is worshiping the father showing us that instead of living our life to please ourself we need to live to please the boss we need to live to please God and that's a challenge I by nature am a people pleaser maybe you are as well you want to help others by our nature, we want to please ourselves, experience pleasure, give ourselves what we want. But Jesus is saying, I came here on a mission. I came here and I am following the directions of the boss. I'm living my life to please God. And he would say the same to you. If you really want to see Jesus, if you really want to follow him, you need to give control of your life to the boss thirdly see the mission if you want to understand who Jesus really is you want to realize who he really is you see the message Jesus said this voice was for your benefit not mine now is the time for judgment on this world now the prince of this world will be driven out and I when I'm lifted up from the earth will draw all people to myself he said this to show the kind of death he was going to die the crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? In other words, we're confused. We thought the Messiah was going to be a literal king like David. We've been counting on the Messiah coming and overthrowing with military might this Roman government that's oppressing us. We thought this messiah was a warrior king and now you're talking about they understood the euphemism here you're talking about you're going to die you're going to not be here with us and yet you say you're the son of man yet you say the messiah they didn't really get it it's hard to get it unless you look to the right sources maybe you know the name bill gates Bill Gates, it's hard to imagine the world today without Microsoft products, isn't it? Bill Gates was asked to give a commencement address to a high school class. This is 30 or so years ago. And he goes to talk to these graduating seniors. <laughs> and he gives them a glimpse of what life will be. You know, when you're 18, you think you know it all. I did. But you don't. So we need others to help us see the cost, to help us see the mission, to help us see what really matters. Bill Gates gave this graduating class these nine rules for life. First, he said, life is not fair. Get used to it. And that's right. 
Secondly, he said, the world won't care about your self-esteem. Third, you will not make $60,000 year, $60, a year right out of high school. Now, update it to today, $100,000 a year. Fourth, if you think your teacher is tough, wait until you meet your boss. Flipping burgers is not beneath your dignity. My grandparents would have called that opportunity. I, I just wondered what the reaction of this, <laughs> the, the, this group was. The, six, he said, don't whine about your mistakes. Learn from them. Seventh, life is not measured in semesters. You don't get a 13-week summer break every year. For a TV is not real life. You have to leave the coffee, coffee shop sometime and go to work. And lastly, be nice to nerds. You'll probably be working for one one day. <laughs> you know, sometimes we don't want to hear it. But we need to understand what it's really about, what it really is. Jesus was clear that following me is going to be hard sometime. And he modeled it. He was about to go to the cross. But at the same time, he said, if you want to really know what life is, you want to find your life, you'd be willing to use it, or lose it rather. You'd be willing to lose it. You see the mission. And lastly, to see that, to see the cost, to see the boss, to see the mission, you have to have the right vision. Then Jesus told him, you're going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light. That is, act on it. Grow in it while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Know where they're going. Believe whoever walks in the dark does not have the light while you have the light, so you may become children of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. It was a foreshadowing. He was soon to be gone from them. So he said, when in doubt, look at me. Look at me to see the light. You know, there is seeing and then there is seeing. Seeing is something you do with your physical sight. Really getting it when it all comes together. That's seeing. The kind of sight God wants us to have. There are many folks, even in church, that believe, but maybe don't see. You know, the reality is that the third way that folks respond to Jesus is rejection. Now, sometimes it's overt. Many see, but do not believe. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. I, I think sometime, how could that have been? How could they hear God talk from heaven and say, this is my son, and not believe? How could they see Jesus raise people from the dead? But then, I think, the manifestations of God's work, of his truth, are all around us. I've seen him take drug addicts and totally turn their life around. I've seen him take people who hit absolute rock bottom and recalibrate and orient their life. I've seen healings that could only be explained by God. The doctors didn't understand. But many believe, but do not see. This was fulfill, fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet. The Lord has believed, Lord who has believed our message and to whom has the Lord arm of the Lord been revealed for this reason they could not believe because as Isaiah says elsewhere he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so they can either see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn and I would heal them Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus glory and spoke about him Isaiah knew human nature in the face of overwhelming ignorant evidence we can still be ignorant we can be willful. We can be self-centered and not believe. The life of faith starts in the head. You believe. 
As I shared with you, C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity, it showed me for the first time you could be a Christian and have a brain. There's lots of evidence for Jesus being who he said he was. I'll talk about this next week, but there is so much evidence for the resurrection that you can understand with your head. But the last part has to be faith. Imagine a test tube. You can fill it 80% full of evidence that Jesus is who he says he was, that this is the kind of life that we best can live. But the last 20% is faith. Many see, but they do not believe. Everybody has the same opportunity to believe in Jesus. But then it's not enough just to believe. We have to see as well. We have to see that there's a choice to make. We have to see that we can live our life to please ourselves or to please God or to please others, but we have to choose. We can't stay on the fence. Yet at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. It's one of the saddest two verses in all of Scripture. Many believed with their head, but because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they'd be put out of the synagogue. How many of us don't say what God would have us say? How many of us blend in instead of talking about our faith? How many of us make compromises to get along? For they loved human praise more than praise from God. It's its own form of rejection. If we believe with our head, but our life doesn't show it. I've said it before. I will I know I will say it again. If you were on trial for being a Christian, what evidence would be presented? This is for us to wrestle with. It's hard. But I'm also telling you it is a key to life. If we can learn to have one boss, if we can learn to live our life to please God and let the chips fall where they may, <laughs> it gets easier. It is not always popular, but it gets easier. The, the target's not moving. You know, if I was still living to please people, I'd have 3,000 bosses, but I have one. So you can have one, but you have to get to the point where you are resolved. You are set. You are settled on following Jesus, that being your mission, on sacrificing and serving others, loving God and loving others. That's what a disciple does. You have to get to that place where you're resolved to do that. What does resolution look like? You believe. You don't waffle. You believe that Jesus is who he says he is. You believe that God is your boss. And you see, you see that God defines and talks about the world in a different way. He talks about life in a different way. His priorities and values are different from this world. And you live. You live it. You don't just talk it. You live it. Imagine if 3,000 of us lived totally sold out for him every day. What a better place this would be. How better our families would be. How better our neighborhoods, how better our schools, how better this place would be. And even more, how better we would be prepared for where we're going, heaven. There's a great old song that says, I'm resolved no longer to linger. I would love that phrase. You know it's easy to linger, don't you? It's easy to hear a good sermon and forget it. It's easy to resolve to change habits like every new year. 
and the next year you make the same resolution. It's easy to linger. But this hymn says, I'm resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. Reminds me of Philippians chapter 4 where Paul says, Finally, my brothers, whatever is pure, whatever is honorable, whatever is admirable, dwell on these things. I will hasten to him. That word has urgency in it. I hasten so glad and free. Jesus, highest, greatest, I will come to thee. You know, the one thing I don't want to be is lukewarm. Now, I can tell you it hasn't always been that way. Jesus says to the church in Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3, that you're neither hot nor cold. You're lukewarm. So I'll spew you out of my mouth. If we live our lives to please everybody and to do everything, we end up not pleasing anyone, including ourselves. So, eyes wide open. Will you come to Jesus? Will you hasten to him? Will you let him start to change you from the inside out? Will you let him make you bold and sold out? Eyes wide open. Father, thank you for this challenge from your word. I thank you that we can find the truth if we look beneath the surface. I'm glad that some are reaching out, some are searching today. I hope you're like light bulbs going off. You're giving us a realization of what it means to be a follower. I pray that none of us would reject your truth or none of us would be stealth Christians. Help us to resolve to follow you. Thank you for working this. Thank you for your patience with us. Help us to be strong. Help us to be true. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, this ministry time, I'm going to be up here after the service. Tim and Lisa will be over here uh, to visit with you. We're here to help you in your spiritual journey. If you want to talk about becoming a Christian, uh, we can uh, talk to you about that. If you want to talk to us about becoming a formal member, partnering with us here, uh, we can help you with that. And we're here to help you in that. If you're watching online or if you just don't want to come to the front, uh, you can call us, you can email us, uh, reach out on the Facebook page or the website. Uh, let us know that you want what, what I was talking about, starting point. I'll visit with you about all those things. Uh, but we'd love to, to hear from you and help you in your journey. It is Easter week. Uh, I want to say to you, remind you that uh, on our Facebook page and website, we put out a devotion every day, uh, Monday through Friday, that I do. Uh, Saturday, my wife Beth does a devotion. It's designed to give you a little daily discipleship moment, uh, and we give you things to think about. But I'll tell you specifically, this week on Thursday and Friday, I'll talk about Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. Now, if you don't know what Monday, Thursday is, you want to tune in on uh, Thursday. But those are there for you. Hopefully, you develop that as a good habit. But we're going to have four services next weekend, Saturday night at 6, which will be a contemporary service like this one, and uh, a Sunday, 8, 9, 20, 10, 40, like normal. Why at a service? We know we're going to have lots of folks. We want you to invite friends and family. There are some cards uh, to invite people with in the lobby there. You can go pick up there on a the table spread out to invite them to service. And, and we're having a service, so uh, adding a service so we can handle uh, the crowds that we know we'll have. We look forward to seeing you in one of those services. If you can make it, you and your family on Saturday night, uh, that would help us. Uh, we'll be child care in all four, right, Joe? Okay, so good to have you with us today. Uh, go out and enjoy this beautiful day. I want you to stand. I'm going to pray with us. And uh, when I say the amen, you're dismissed. Have a great week. Father, we thank you for your love. 
and your goodness and we thank you for what you want to do in us uh, that how you want us to give you uh, give us a, a great life a uh, life that matters a life that makes a difference so work in us lead us we pray in jesus name amen see you later Thank you.